classification. In other words, something that's a subclass is a more specialized version of, um, of the superclass. So, for example, we talked about a specialist being a more specialized, pardon the pun, version of a consultant. Um, another way to look at it is, again, as we move up the inheritance structure, the, the classes above it are more generalized and the classes on the bottom of it are more specialized. So if we have that, inherit from that, inherit from that, this one is the most specialized of these classes. This one is the most general. Uh, another way to say general would be to say that these classes are more abstract near the top of the list, where these are more specific. Now, let's talk about, for example, if we were a veterinarian, all right, um, or a pet store or something like that. Let's say our business was, was pets, all right. We could have at the top of the chain pet. And then maybe underneath the pet, we could have dog. And underneath dog, we could have Labrador. And underneath that, we could have Beagle. And so on down the line. All right. Um, if there's different kinds of Labradors, we could even go further down if we wanted to. By the same token, we could have cat. And we could have a Persian, and an American short hair, and so on down the line. Now, at some levels of this, for the, within the context of the problem that we're trying to solve, it wouldn't necessarily be very meaningful to talk about a specific pet on one of the higher levels. What do I mean by that? Um, a veterinarian, and keep in mind there's all kinds of, whoops, there's all kinds of other pets that you could have too. You know, you could have lizards and fish and all that sort of stuff. At a, at a, at a certain point though, it's not meaningful to talk about a, someone's pet on that level. For example, if I were to say, what do I feed my pet? How long do I expect my pet to live? How much is my pet going to weigh at adulthood? None of that makes sense if we're looking at it on simply the level of a pet, right? In other words, that's not a terribly meaningful way to look at an actual running around or swimming around or flying around your house pet to say it's a pet, all right? Now, it might be reasonable to say, I have a cat. What should I feed it, all right? You could have a cat, right? I have a cat. Is it one of these? I have no idea, but I know it's a cat. So it might be meaningful to talk about it on the level of, hey, you got a cat. Similar thing probably with dog and so on. But really, within the context of a veterinary office or a pet shop, it's probably not meaningful to say, hey, I have a pet. What kind of pet is it? I don't know. It's a pet. All right? It reminds me of, uh, I, think it was, uh, I think it was Cousin Vinny where the guy, they go into the diner and, and the three things on the menu were breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, you just ordered one of those things, right? That's not terribly meaningful. Uh, to, to look at it on that level. It's much more meaningful to look at it on a more specific level. This brings in a notion of what's called an abstract class. Uh, an abstract class, and I, I've thought a lot about this today, about the best way to describe an abstract class. And I can tell you the, the rule. First of all, an abstract class is a class that cannot be instantiated. So I cannot say something like, if I were to make this guy, an abstract class, 
I could not say, Pat, Fluffy, equals new Pat. Couldn't do that. All right, because that's an abstract class, which means I cannot create an instance of a pet. All right, I cannot instantiate a pet. Uh, another way to say it is it's not meaningful to, to, for the context of our problem to view something on that level. All right, any real life entities will be described, need to be described more specifically to be meaningful within our problem domain. Okay. Um, so therefore, I couldn't declare it as a pet. Now, I could do something like this. I could say pet fluffy equals new dog, assuming that none of these were abstract and going down the line. But I'm not instantiating that abstract class. I have to instantiate one of the concrete classes. Now, what's the benefit of doing that? Well, the benefit of doing that is there still might be some behaviors that exist on that level. All right? It's just that um, in order for it to really be meaningful, you have to declare it at one of the more specific levels. Let's look at an example of tuition calculation at LC. This is an assignment I give in a lot of my other classes because it's kind of a quirky uh, tuition policy that we have here. But let, let's go and look at the tuition policy and let's, let's attempt to, to sort of model this uh, within classes and then implement it. All right. All right, we look at this, we will see that, let's forget about these extra fees, and who knows about those, but we'll notice that your tuition is calculated one of several different ways. Dep two things, depending on the number of credit hours you take and your residency status. There's three residency statuses, Loring County residents, out of county residents, out of state residents. And then there's a number of credit hours and there's really three ranges for the credit hours. Um, there's 1 to 12, there's 13 through 18, and then there's 19 through 22. 1 through 12 is simply whatever your rate is, whatever your credit hour rate is, times the number of credit hours. So for example, one credit hour for a Lorain County resident is 103.05. For out of county is 123.95, and for out of state is 249.65. And you can go on down the line. So if you notice, 10 is simply 10 times that number, 10 times that number, 10 times that number. Now, it gets different in the 13 through 18 credit hour range, because 13 through 18 credit hours, you get charged a flat rate. So if you take 13 or if you take 18, you get charged the same amount, which is the amount of 13 credit hours. So 13 or 14 or 15 credit hours all cost the same. Lastly, 19 and up, they stop at 22, but we could assume it would go on up, um, is essentially what you pay for 13 plus whatever hours over 18 you are. So in other words, if you take 19 credit hours, you get charged the 13 credit hours plus your one credit hour over 18, you get charged that. Another way to look at it is you get charged your credit hours minus 5. So if you work, not, or not work, but if you take 19 credit hours, you get charged for 14. If you take 20, you get charged for 15 and so on and up. So that calculation applies for all students. What's different is the specific rate of the student. Each student, each class of student, or each type of student has a different rate. So 
Now, keep in mind there's a lot of reasonable ways that you can solve some of these problems. Um, today I want to demonstrate abstract class and abstract methods. All right. So what I will do is I'm going to create an abstract class and I'm going to create a couple of subclasses for that. Let's think about the classes that we're going to create here. All right. I'm going to create four classes. I'm going to create a student class, which is going to be an abstract class because Within this problem domain, it's not enough to say I have a student. I have to say what kind of student I have. So therefore, I'm going to make that an abstract, which means that I can't instantiate a student. Um, I would have to instantiate one of the other types of students. I'm then going to make two subclasses underneath that. I'm going to make an in-county student, all right, and I'm going to make an out-of-county student. And then I'm going to make an out-of-state student. Does everyone see why I have that inheritance going that way as opposed to having three lines going across. I suppose an alternative way of doing this, and I'll draw it in dashed lines, would be to have the out of state on this level. I, I could do it that way, but I've chose to do it that way. How would you explain why I would do it this way? Yes? Because you're still out of contact. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the old is a test, right? An out-of-state student is also an out-of-county student, right, by definition. And therefore, even if it's not particularly relevant for this problem I'm trying to solve, I'm going to develop it that way because that's how it works in the real world, all right? Remember, what you do when you're creating these classes, uh, sometimes I'll call this modeling, you know, you're creating, a, 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 in effect, a model of the real world. And sometimes it's good to take off your programmer hat and not think in terms of code and, and all this, but think, how is it really in the real world? And in the real world, this is a more accurate description than this. It's certainly conceivable that um, there could be other um, variations between someone that lives in state and someone that lives out of state that don't relate to tuition, in which case, or someone that lives out of county versus in county. So it makes sense to do this because this is the most realistic. So, if we look at this, the algorithm that calculates what a person's tuition is, where is that going to live? In other words, the code that, uh, yeah. Repeat, please. Correct. The abstract class. So calculate tuition is going to be here. Why is that? Why is it going to live there? Yes. Because all three of them use it. And in fact, all three of them use the exact same code. All right. In other words, the code to calculate the tuition for an out-of-state resident and to, to calculate an out-of-county resident or a Lorraine County resident is all identical. The only difference in the code will be the rate. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a get rate method on each of the three subclasses. So I'll put a get rate here. I'll put a get rate here, and I'll put a get rate here. All right. Now, this calculate tuition function is going to call get rate, right? Because for it to do its thing, 
For it to do its thing, it needs to know the rate for the given type of student. Do you see anything wrong with that picture? I don't want to say wrong, but what's something else that we have to do? We don't have to cast. We have to declare the get rate function on the student level. Right? Because if we're going to write a method that's going to accept any student and calculate their tuition, we're going to call the calculate tuition method. That calculate tuition method is going to need to call the get rate method, which better be defined on each of these levels. But if we don't define it on this level, we're going to get a compile error because it's going to try compiling it. When we compile it and look at the student get rate, it's not going to know about these other subclasses, or the student calculate tuition rather. It's not going to know about these other subclasses, and therefore it's not going to know that there's going to be a get rate info in there, uh, a function in there. Another way to say this is we know that calculate tuition has to have has to call the get rate function to work. We have to be able to ask the specific kind of student that it is, hey, what's your rate? Okay? Therefore, any subclass of student, we have to guarantee has a get rate method. All right? There's not really going to be a get rate method here because we can't write a generic get rate method for all students because it's different for each student type. Yet, we somehow have to guarantee that any subclass of student has a get rate method. Now, we do that by declaring what's called an abstract method. All right? So we're going to have an abstract method within an abstract class. What's an abstract method? An abstract method is one that has to exist on any subclass that, that extends that object. Sort of forgetting our programmer hat again and, and thinking about this logically, we know that any student has to be able to tell us the rate. So any subclass of student there has to be a get rate function on because we have to be able to say, hey, out of county student, what's your rate? In county student, what's your rate? We know that because that's part of the calculate tuition function. Yet we can't write a generic get rate method that's going to work, right? Because each kind of student has their own different tuition rate. There could be, for example, if we could extend this further and maybe have graduate students. Maybe they get charged a different rate or, or something like that. In which case, again, we have to guarantee that those have a get rate method. All right? Uh, and yet, we can't really put any code in there. So we have to make it an abstract function. So let's go and let's create this. Then we'll create a little bursar object that will, uh, you know, register a student that will tell them how much their tuition is. So let's go and, and do that now. Um, let me go in here. I'll get rid of everything but keep in mind as I am doing this, I am going to um, only uh, implement the relevant methods here. In other words, yeah, there's probably going to be a student name and, and a student number and a student major and whatever. We'll, we'll forget about that for now. All right. So.
All right. So I'm going to declare two functions, one being a regular old, I suppose you call it concrete function. I don't know the opposite of abstract. That's actually going to work like a regular function did. And I have a, uh, a, an abstract function. With an abstract function, all I do uh, essentially is uh, describe the signature of the function. In other words, the function has to be called get rate. It accepts no arguments and it returns a double. I'm not going to put any code on this level, again, because there's nothing in common with uh, each of these is not, uh, doesn't have anything in common, so I can't put any common code in here. Each one of them is going to have its own distinct way of implementing that get rate method. Now, to be sure, it's going to be fairly straightforward. Each is going to return their own number, but again, there's no real common code that we can put here. What I can do here, though, is I can actually do my calculation double tuition and I can say return tuition and I can say something like if arg hours are less than 13 then tuition equals get rate times arg hours. All right. Else if arg hours are less than 19, then tuition equals get rate times 13. Finally, else all right does that look legit did I dot my I's and cross my T's and so on. If hours are less than 13, the tuition is get rate times arg hours. To be absolutely clear, I'm going to say this. I don't have to because if you don't specify uh, an object to call it on, it assumes this. But I want to make sure that's absolutely clear, so I'll say this. Dot get rate. All right. Hours less than 13, that's how you calculate it. Otherwise, if the hours are less than 19, you get charged for 13 credit hours. Otherwise, you get charged for the rate times hours minus 5. In any case, you return tuition. It might give me a warning about not initializing tuition, so I'll go and put that in there. Now, again, this is an abstract function. We're not going to implement it on this level, but we want to be absolutely sure that any object that extends this is going to implement it. Because otherwise, the whole thing falls apart. Why do we have to put that in as an abstract function? Because we're using a, that function on this level, and if we didn't implement it as an abstract function, this wouldn't compile. All right, I can, I can take that out. It, you know, we, can, we can try some of these things to demonstrate what I'm saying, and maybe that will make it more clear. But let's go and finish this up. So let's go and, all right, I say that. Let me, let me first do, um, let's just do uh, an in-county student. Let's do a save.
an attic stand student. Now, I have to implement, because I defined on the superclass this method as abstract, I have to implement it on this level. So I can say something like return 10305. All right. Now, let's go and save that. We'll save our out county and 123.95 and then out state which we've identified extends out county. And that is 249.65. And I messed that up. I think I messed up out of county, so let's go back and edit that. All right. So I think everything's okay. Let's go make our test code. And our test code will go and we'll make various classes of different types and we'll then call that and make sure that we get the right number. So let's go and open up this. And let's go here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to create a student. All right, let's try to do the calculation on just a plain old student. What should happen here? Should get a compile error because we cannot instantiate simply a student. might get a compiler error for 50 other uh, types. Okay, I did forget a semicolon in that, so we'll go back and fix that. All right, student is 
not abstract and does not override abstract method get rate and student. All right. Essentially, that's telling me that um, this is an abstract class. Oh, wait a minute. Forgot to do that. I was, I was a little surprised at the verbiage of that error. I mean, I understood it was complaining about the fact that there was no function for get rate. And it should have complained over the fact that that is an abstract class. And there we go. Student is abstract, can't be instantiated. So we can't, and we can't create a student. A student is not specific enough to be for this problem domain. We have to declare one of the other kinds of students. So let's go in and let's alter our test code to say, now can I do this? Student S equals in county. Yes, I can create that because an in-county student is a student. So I can create an in-county student and point to them with a student. And when I call calc tuition, it will call it and it will get the appropriate values uh, or the appropriate code for the, the, um, the uh, get rate method. So it will get the appropriate rate. So let's go and compile this now. All right, no errors. And it says that's 10305, which I believe is right. Okay. Now, what I can do is I'll create an out of county. and out of state and do the calculations and make sure that those are right. Now notice again what I'm doing is, is each time I'm doing this I'm like adding to my suite of test cases. That way I can verify that it's right. All right. And I think that's right. We could look it up to see for sure. But sure looks like that is the, the correct calculation. Now, if you were going to test this, how many test cases would you have? Yes. Nine. Nine. Nine's a decent answer. <laughs> it's better than saying one, right? It's better than saying three. Do we have another number? Six? Okay. Any other numbers? If this was the price is right, what would the audience be yelling now? Uh, I would say, first of all, I must be the only one old enough to watch the price is right. And yeah, higher, higher. I would suggest, the bare minimum I would suggest would be 12. All right. How do I get 12? I'd want to test the border between the lower um, group and the middle group, the border between the middle group and the lower group, the border between the middle group and the highest group, the border between the highest group and the middle group. And I'd want to do that for all three of those. So minimally, that would be 4 for each of the three or 12. Um, you could probably even do more then. You could probably pepper a few more in. One that was in the low range of that, one that's in the middle of that, and one that was in the high range. There's, again, uh, I, th I, I apologize if I repeat this, but, that, but there's what they call white box and black box testing. Black box testing is where you do not make any assumptions that you know what's going on inside the code. White box testing is where you look and you say, hmm, I know the way that this algorithm works, that the key 
places on this algorithm are around 12 and 13, around 18 and 19, so that's the places that I'll test. And I also know that it's important to test between um, in county, out of county, out of state. Yes? Well, what I was suggesting was this border, this border, this border, and this border, which would be four uh, different points repeated three times, so that would be 12. Now, you could extend that to say, I want something over here as well, over here as well, over here as well, in which case that would be seven points, and that would give you 21. So. The bare minimum would be 12, 21 would also be acceptable for that. Yes? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the question was, is could you, could you iterate through a loop uh, from 1 to 22? Yeah. Perfect. That would work too. Um, this is, um, yeah, this, this would lend itself to that. Not all of the things that you would do would necessarily lend itself to that. You know, not all the, the all those kind of coding uh, things that you're testing would lend itself to that kind of thing. But yeah, that would be a great idea in this case. Sure. Try to recreate that chart, right? If you can't recreate the chart, you didn't do something right. I guess my point is, is, um, one thing I want to stress in this class is testing. So think in terms of what, at the very least, you need to test. All right, the, 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 the bare minimum of what you need to test and so on. You know, if there's several different possibilities, you know, I don't want to see a test code that tests one of them. You know, think for example in your um, example of creating a car. We said there's a couple ways you can create a car. You can create a car with a no constructor, no argument constructor. You can create one by passing some arguments. At the very least, you should test both of those, right? So minimally for that, there'd be two. When you start adding on, for example, for whatever the next assignment is, where there's lodging and this and this and this, you know, there's a variety of different combinations uh, that you could have. All right. Now. I want to show you what happens if I don't have this abstract function. What's going to happen is I'm going to get a compile error. Because inside the student class, it's making use of that get rate method. And therefore, that get rate method, even though this is an abstract class and can't be instantiated, and even though all the subclasses implement that, I still get a compile error because we haven't guaranteed that any future subclass is also going to implement that. And we haven't guaranteed, from the perspective of the compiler, it doesn't know that each class below it has implemented it. So we have to go in and declare that as an abstract if we don't want to write any code for it. Which in this case we don't because there's really no common code we could do. What if I do not implement it on one of the other classes? If I, for example, for in county, if I don't specify a get rate method. All right. It tells me that in county is not abstract and does not override the abstract method get rate in student. So therefore, it's going to gripe about that. One thing to keep in mind is you can actually chain these abstract methods down. It doesn't have to be the direct subclass. It just has to be the first concrete subclass. So for example, if I were to make a, uh, a class of student, which was abstract, and a subclass of undergrad, 
that was also abstract. And then I had my in state, oh, I'm sorry, in county, out of county, out of state. If I declare the get rate as an abstract method up here, all right, I wouldn't have to implement it here because that's another abstract class and I can't instantiate it. But if these were all concrete classes, then I would have to implement it here, here, and here. So you can sort of pass the buck from one abstract class to another, but once you hit those concrete classes, you have to, uh, you have to go in and implement them. All right. Now, the, the last thing I want to show you is, is why do we even have that abstract class then? Again, because we'll get the benefits of being able to treat it polymorphically. So I can do this. I can write a bursar class. A bursar, if I'm not mistaken, is a person in the college that gets the money. I can declare this function to accept any kind of student. And a number of hours. And it will then calculate based on the kind of student that it was created as. Again, exploiting the, the polymorphism. Um, And I'll just do maybe one test case here. I'll do a test two. So I can pass that bursar class, a student object, and a number of hours, and it will do the calculation. So I can use that abstract class as like an argument or return value, but I simply can't instantiate a member of it. And I can use it as an argument or as, or as a return value to treat it polymorphically. All right, so that I can give it any kind of student and it will use the appropriate get rate method. All right, for that. All right. 
Let's make sure this works. All right, and it, it does it that way using the, the um, using the, the right method and using the bursar class to call the student class. Now, if we can summarize here, the benefit of inheritance in this particular case, there's really two benefits to inheritance that we get in this case. Can anyone describe what those two benefits are? Right. Number one, the one benefit of inheritance is the reusability of the code. If we look at the if we look at the student class, we define the calculate tuition function on the student level. We did not have to repeat that on each of the levels below it. All right. So we defined it on this level, the calculate tuition method, and we got some reusability out of the code because these three, we did not have to write separate functions to do that calculation. All right? So reusability of code is one benefit. Now, again, we're just doing this in a very limited scope of doing this tuition calculation, but there very well could be other things that you could uh, implement in that student class that could be shared among all these three classes. So that's one benefit. Any idea what the other benefit is of inheritance? Yes. Flexibility specifically relating to polymorphism. All right. We can treat this polymorphically. In other words, we can call a method and pass the superclass and it will work on any of the subclasses. All right. Um, and what's better is it will get the right version of the function, of the method to use. So um, I can't call subclass specific methods. In other words, if I declared a method on one of the subclasses, I couldn't call it if I was treating it polymorphically. But when I treat it polymorphically, I get the right version of all of those functions that exist on there. So I get the right get rate function, for example, in this case. That's the two benefits of inheritance. Now, we talked about last time how in Java there's only a single layer, layer of inheritance. All right? But in the real world, um, things can be looked at a number of different ways. For example, um, you know, a, a, a bird could be looked on as a thing with feathers, a bird could be looked on as a flying thing, and a bird could be looked on as an animal. So, all three of those is a statements are correct. Yet if we were developing an object oriented solution for that, we could only inherit one of them. What we will look at next time is a notion of an interface. And what an interface does is we don't get both the benefits of inheritance. With, with, with inheritance we get the benefit of reusable code and polymorphism. With interfaces we don't get the reusable code, but at least we get the polymorphism. So we can treat all flying things the same way. We could ask all flying things maybe a certain set of questions like, what's your maximum speed? What's your maximum height? And we know if it's a flying thing that it's able to answer those questions. Therefore, we can give, we can write polymorphic functions to get passed in any flying thing and it returns the right uh, method for calculating the the maximum height or maximum speed or whatever. All right? That's where we'll pick up next time. It's sort of Java's compromise for the multiple inheritance issue. All right. We'll see you up in lab.